First, let me thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts with you. And I must state in advance that I'll not talk about myself at all. It is very difficult to ask one to talk about oneself. But I'll share my thoughts with you as a Kenyan and as an African. I want to preface my conversation with you out of a book that I first read in 1979. I've not read the book since, but I remember the book very well. This is a book written by one of the great Greek writers, Sophocles. It contains three books or three plays which are very famous and which I believe you should know. And if you do not know them, I believe that you will find out where they are and read them this evening. The three plays are Antigone, Oedipus at Colonus and Oedipus. I have faith that you have read those famous plays written long before the birth of Christ. And I want to preface, as I said, what I want to say with a conversation that takes place in the book of Oedipus. Oedipus is a Greek legend and it is recorded in that book that it was prophesied by the oracle of Apollo that Oedipus would kill his father and marry his mother. And when he was born, the parents threw him into the wilderness that the prophecy may not come to pass. Unknown to them, the little boy was picked up by somebody and brought up and in his adulthood he heard about the story and he tried to run away from home and as he was running away he met an old man and killed the old man. Little did he know that that was his father. Of course, the story then says that he went into the kingdom of Thebes and he saved the city by solving a riddle. And the prize was that he was allowed to marry the dead king's wife. Little did he know that the dead king's wife was his mother, Jocasta, his father having been King Liars. Then tragedy started striking in Thebes. People were dying. Bad things were happening and he himself decreed that whoever found out what killed the king would be exiled from the land. And of course one of the seers of Apollo said that he was the one who had committed the crime. And he was exiled. And what I wanted to speak about is to be found in the last portion of that play. When Oedipus has been removed out of his city, he's been exiled. And as he goes out, the commoners who are commentating on the play says, Behold, sons and daughters of Thebes. This was Oedipus, the greatest of all men. He was envied by all men. Behold, what a tide of misfortune swept over his head. Then learned that mortal man must always look to his ending, and none can be called happy until the day that he dies and carries his happiness to the grave in peace. Why did I want to cite that? That is equally true that none can be called successful until the day that he or she dies and carries his success to the grave in peace. As long as we are alive, 
any claim that we are successful is not only arrogant but misguided. For the moment what we appear to be doing is that we are on the right path. And what you should do is to pray that we should continue to be on that path. History has demonstrated times without number that men whom we thought to be successful betray you at the 11th hour. And therefore, ours is to be humble. I'm still with you in Greece. In those days of Sophocles, there also lived a great man, Socrates, of whom you know much. It is recorded that the oracle of Apollo wanted to determine who was the wisest man in Greece. And he sent out one of his oracles to go out in Greece and determine who was the wisest. In those days, Greece was known for many great things. The great writers of the time. If it was not Sophocles, it was Aristophanes. If it was not Aristophanes, it was Socrates or somebody else. When the oracle went out, the oracle came back and said that the wisest man in Greece was Socrates. And the only reason why the oracle arrived at that conclusion was when Socrates was asked, what do you know? He said, the only thing that I know is that I know nothing. <laughs> it is his humility that set him apart as the wisest man in Greece. So I too come here by saying the only thing that I know is that I know nothing. But progressively and consistently, I try to understand my environment. And this started very early on when I was a student. Nowadays I see students of Nairobi University. I was in 1984 and 1985 the chairman of the students organization of Nairobi University. And when I campaigned to be the student, I did not spend a single cent. Today, I hear that students spend 10 million and I, I wonder why. In other words, I'm trying to say that there is an ethic which is perverted, which now controls not only our country, but our people. Last year, I was in Dar es Salaam. I was invited to Dar es Salaam to help some of my colleagues there with the constitution which will be subjected to referendum in Tanzania next month, hopefully. And as I was traveling at the Julius Kambarage Nyerere International Airport in Dar es Salaam on my way back to Kenya, I had my bag. I had liquid in my bag. I wanted to check it in, to carry it on rather. But they told me I had to check it in. It was not padlocked. I went to a young man who was selling padlocks. And I told him I wanted a padlock. And he asked me in Kiswahili, And I said, Nairobi. I said, ah, wa Kenya. Where's he how? Nunua kufuli mbili. That tells you the image of Kenyans that is out there. Several years ago, I was in Zanzibar under Tanzanian minister in his ungodly moment was speaking and he said, Hili swala la jumuia Afrika mashariki ni swala nzuri sana. Kwanza, itapanua soko ito wawezesha wana wa Afrika mashariki kusafiri lakini kitu kinacho tuogopesha ni wa Kenya <laughs> kwanza kabisa hawana nidhamu siasa zao ni duni na za kikabila tuna hofu ya kwamba wakiingia katika Afrika Mashariki watatuambukiza ukabila. Jambo la pili ni walafi. 
na wanapenda sana ardhi tayari wanaimezea mate ardhi yetu you may not and in fact you are not supposed to like what i'm telling you but i'm trying to tell you that that is the image that we have out there on our side what image do we have of tanzanians lazy and polite polite equally of tanzanians or ugandans but the question is we claim to be a christian country 80% christians but whenever i go to church on sunday when the congregation is invited to take the holy communion and their reverence here they tell the congregation we are in the house of god but ladies carry your bags because there are people who may still even in church we still i said at one time in mombasa that we live in a country where we profess the blood of christ but in truth the blood of ethnicity is thicker than the blood of christ because when the chips are down it is our ethnicity that counts not our christianness you young men when you are communicating via twitter via facebook and other media the venom that you spew out in the name of ethnicity is appalling and worrying the question is who are your role models today there is a culture in this country which i call the sunkonization culture the youth have been sunkonized and i'm creating this word deliberately what is sunkonization Sunkonization is the process of acquisition of material wealth by means that are unknown and unfathomable. <laughs> and once it has been so acquired is to distribute that wealth with abject abandon in order to entice the people whose only desire is to acquire wealth by whatever means today that is what dominates in this country and what dominates in africa and one of the most difficult things to be in kenya today is to be truthful and to be honest if you speak the truth and if you are honest it is very difficult to survive in Kenya and in Africa our indiscipline as a people and as a population is manifested on our roads it is manifested in our markets it is manifested everywhere we see it with our leaders at all levels those are our role models so the question is when you ask us to speak about Kenya and to talk about Nijenge Kenya what are we talking about are we saying that this country as presently constituted can remain as it is on the shoulders of you young men and women if you read the bible there is the story of a person called Simeon and he said of this Simeon that when he had heard that Christ has had been born he said that he could now die because he knew that what was written had been fulfilled and there was no reason to worry the question is of your generation can we say that we can now die that we are confident that Kenya is safe because throughout history it is young people who have provided the means via which societies have been transformed remember i said that i was not going to talk about myself because there is nothing to talk about 
The only thing to talk about is to give you evidence of what is as against what we desire in the hope that you young men and women 50 years from today you shall contribute positively to the Negroid race. Our race. Our country. Our continent. If you look through history and ask yourself what was the age of the young Europeans who came to this country in the 18th century to conquer Africa? What was the age of Henry Model Stanley? What was the age of Speak and Huntington? They were in their twenties. They were unmarried. They came to this continent and captured this continent and enslaved us, our ancestors. What was the age of William Wilberforce when he was agitating for the abolition of slavery? They were in their twenties and in their thirties. Young people have always been at the center of conquest. What was the age of Jan van Riebeck when he settled in South Africa in the Cape Coast in 1688? What was the age of Ferdinand de Braza when he conquered what is now Congo Brazzaville? There were young people in 1908 when the tax were changing their circumstances giving birth to the people now called the young Turks. What was the age of those young people? What was the age in those early days of those who led the Russian Revolution? What was the age of Vladimir Lenin? They were young in their thirties. What was the age of Martin Luther King Jr.? when he led the civil rights movement? What was the age of the independence fighters? What was the age of Eduardo Mondlane in Mozambique? What was the age of Samora Moises Marshall when he led the struggle in Mozambique? I'm speaking to you young people. What was the age of Nelson Mandela in 1964? or that of Oliver Tambo in South Africa? What was the age of Sam Nuyoma and Toivo Ya Toivo in Namibia? What was the age of Agostino Nato in Angola and Holden Roberto and Jonas Maviro Savimbi? <laughs> they were young people. I'm taking you through Africa in order for you to appreciate and I want you to look at the map of Africa. What was the age of Kenneth David Kaunda in Zambia and that of Hastings Kamuzubanda in Malawi? What was the age of Thomas Joseph Mboya in this country? What was the age of Julius Kambarage Nyerere and Oscar Kambona and Apollo Milton Oboti and Patrice Emery Lumumba and Modibo Keita and Ufe Bwanyi and Kwame Nukuruma. What was their age? Your age. And at that time they knew only one thing that we had to liberate the continent. They had no wealth. They had only one thing, conviction. When Kuruma was speaking in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia on the 13th day of May 1963 in his famous speech where he said Africa must unite now. He said before we leave here, Africa must have one government, Africa must have one army, Africa must have one common defense, Africa must have one currency, Africa must have one government because if we don't do that, you will get used to your little countries and Africa will be weak. Last year, when the current chair of the Agri Organization of African Unity or the African Union, Kosan and Lamin in Zuma, was giving a speech and Vision 2063 of Africa, she wrote an imaginary letter to Kwame Nukuruma. 
And she was merely repeating the same things that Nkrumah was saying in 1963. Let us look neither east nor west. Let us look forward. Fifty years down the line, what does Africa offer? Because we are talking about role models. What does Africa offer us today? The African economy is 1.2 trillion dollars. That is the combined GDP of the African economy. The economy of Brazil with 151 million people, give or take, is also 1.12 trillion dollars. The economy of Russia is the same size as the economy of Africa with 1 billion people. Intra-African trade is no more than 20%. Africans are dying younger than they were in 1963. All the diseases that we thought we had conquered are back. Leprosy is back. Malaria is back. And as if we are being visited by other plagues, Ebola is alive and well. HIV is alive and well. That is the Africa in which we live. The question is, is your generation going to be the generation that will liberate us? On the evidence that I have, I do not think I'm confident. On the available evidence, I do not think so. Why don't I think so? Because your generation is attracted to that which is European and American. Young men and women, what are you seeking the green card? And I've said it in different forums, young men and women are dying in the Mediterranean when they want to go to Europe and America. Young men and women are attracted to things that are not African. I was at a forum and I asked uh, my audience, in order to test how familiar they are with Africa, I asked them, who is the president of Namibia? How many of you know that Ifekepunye Pohamba is the president of Namibia? How many of you know that the president of Mozambique is called Nyusi? You do not know, but you know the footballer who scored last night in the football match between Villarreal and Barcelona. It has always been a battle of the mind and if our minds are not in our control, nine out of ten times we'll always lose out. That is how grim the reality is. When I look at Africa today, I can now appreciate how we were colonized. Every time we were always afraid to confront our reality. If you look at the Kenyan economy today, even if it grows, for whom does it grow? Let us look at different sectors before I come back to my theme and conclude quickly. The Kenyan economy is the largest economy in East Africa with a GDP after rebasing of 50 billion United States dollars. The Walmart supermarket in the United States of America last year had an annual turnover of 450 United States dollars. In other words, Walmart supermarket with 3,000 employees generates more money than 42 million of us combined. And yet we are the biggest economy in East Africa. So for whom are we growing? Let us look at the different sectors. Let us look at the communication sector who owns Safaricom. Forget the little things that you buy at the Nairobi Stock Exchange, which is no more than 10%. It is Vodafone. Who owns Orange? It is French. Who owns Airtel? It is the Indians. Tell me what you own. <laughs> Let us go into the beer industry. Aside from Keroshe, who owns East African breweries, forget the little little things that you do in the Nairobi Stock Exchange. This token of 10% which is sold to you to humor you. I'm not telling you that you sell it, but I'm just giving you the reality. Go to the tea industry, who owns the tea industry, who runs Finlay's, 
who runs the coffee industry, go to Thika, who owns the pineapples, is Del Monte. Who owns our railways, the Rift Valley Railways, which is South African. What do we own? I want you to think about it in that way. It is not lost on me that the TV stations will be back on air so soon after the visit of Aga Khan. It is not lost on me, despite what others may say. In other words, I am saying that we may talk about role models, but the Europeans and other civilizations know what they want. So there is no point of talking about myself. There is only every point of pointing out to you what you need to do. Today, Every other civilization know what they want. The Europeans know what they want and they are going about it steadily as they have over the years. The Americans are clear about what they want and they follow it steadily. The Arabs forget Syria and Iraq. The Kuwaitis know what they want. The Qataris know what they want. The United Arab Emirates know what they want. The Bahrainians know what they want. The Omanians know what they want. The Asians know what they want. The South Koreans know what they want. The Japanese know what they want. The Vietnamese know what they want. What do the Africans want? Do they know what they want? If they knew they would not be rising, the Nuer would not rise against the Dinka in South Sudan. If they knew what they wanted, the Shiluk would not be abducting armies, little children, so that they may fight the Nuer and the Juba government. A young government. He was born in Nyeri and he said at age 60 I'll change Nyeri. And he was now 70 and discovered that he could not change Nyeri, he's now 80. And he was born in Karima and he said I'll now change my village, he was now 90. At 95, he said, I wish I'd changed myself. <laughs> Don't be of that ilk. The only thing that needs change is yourself. Once you change yourself, there is no limit to what you can do. Let me stop there. God bless. Uh, I believe in changing these nations. So I'm just looking for three burning questions. We still have many speakers. We have uh, musicians in the building for commercial break. And you know, uh, we need to make these as quick as possible. Anybody just shoot up your hand. Three guys, only three questions. Let me start with the last question. You know, what happened in this country in 1992 is that we introduced money in our politics. If you read a little history of this country, there was something called Youth for Kanu 92. It is during the period of Youth for Kanu 92 that the 500 denomination note was introduced into this country and the economy has never recovered. At that time, the Kenyan shilling, the dollar to the Kenyan shilling was under... 30 shillings or thereabouts. Then what has happened, the politicians have now mastered this to impoverish the people and of course when the people are, people are impoverished then they want instant gratification. It is the education of the people. The people must be educated. The reason why we are called the third world at one time I once said at one time that the reason why we are called the third world is because there is no fourth world. If there was a fourth or a fifth world, we'll be called the fifth world. And it is a state of the mind. The question is, even now, you who is at Nairobi University, you know that during the campaigns, the students hire goons. The students buy beer. And this, so the question of, uh, of, of, of civic education is not the answer. It's a culture. We have developed a culture today where we think that money is the be all and all. We must liberate ourselves from that culture. A, a young Kenyan called Professor Ken Walibora has written a book Mbaya Wetu in Kiswahili. 
in Kenya today we have a culture where when you get money we don't ask how you get the money and I think there is something that must be done the leadership must be from the top as a young person in 1994 I worked with Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere in his foundation in Dar es Salaam when he was doing the Gundrundi talk and, and an amazing man Mwalimu Nyerere one day we were traveling to his office and he told the, the driver wanted to cross the traffic lights. He told Usipite, Kama mimi ni kiongozi, lazima ni yongoze kwa kuonyesha wa Tanzania. During his entire life, when Nyerere was elected as the president, he refused to stay at the state house. He said, nyumba kubwa hii naifanya nini? Instead, he had a small house at Msasani and that is where he, where he lived. Leadership by example. That is what we must have. Leadership by example. The former president of, uh, of Cape Verde, on the day that he ceased to be the president, he took a taxi to his mother's house. I'm not saying that he, my one must be poor, but he's telling you how people live. We must lead by example and it's a personal choice. Have you made that choice? You must make that personal choice. Corruption. I speak about and write about and against corruption. We love drama. One, three weeks ago in Tanzania, two cabinet ministers resigned on a mere allegation that they were involved in corruption. The Attorney General of Tanzania resigned on the ground that he was involved in corruption. Yesterday, we charged several individuals and more will continue to be charged. I want you to watch this space. There will be no conviction. Three years down the line, I pray there is a conviction. But I fear there will be no conviction. We love drama, so the newspapers will dramatize. Where is the Tokyo case? When I am answering your question, when I was the director of the Anti-Corruption Authority, I want you to read the answer on the day that they amended the law to abolish our offices. One of the ministers who is now a cabinet minister said, you must remove these fellows. If you don't, we'll all be in jail. We arrested one cabinet minister and he said, he told me to my face, I'll be acquitted and he was acquitted. And the day we arrested him, members of parliament from his tribe were in my office. By a way to, he's a thief, but he's our thief. <laughs> you see the attitude of Kenyans? Today, if you arrested a cabinet minister from a particular ethnic group, they would begin railing about it. Today, my friend Chris Ogure has been arrested. He'll continue to serve as a senator. Should he? Should he? But he will continue. The argument will be, as long as he has not been convicted, he is guilty until proven innocent. It is not a question of being proved innocent. The former president of Tanzania, Ali Hassan Mwinyi, resigned when he was a minister in charge of prisons because a prisoner had escaped. He did not stop him from being the president of Tanzania. Edward Lowassa was the prime minister. He resigned because there were allegations of corruption. He could possibly be the president of Tanzania this year in October. Possibly. It is a culture and a tradition. But how do we start in Kenya? Where do we start corruption? You parents buy examination papers for your children in primary. I love you, mommy. Therefore, what do I do for you? I buy you exam papers. Then you pass. So your entire life is a lie. Your entire life is a lie. History has demonstrated that 
If you want to fight the corruption, the entire society must be against it. In countries such as Japan, if an allegation is made, you commit suicide. There is honor. Here, if you are allowed to be corrupt, you seek public office. When we elect you as a governor or a senator, you see the, 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 the ethics and the values. How will people with ideas ever acquire power in Africa? Not easy. Not easy. As long as we have this electorate. A friend of mine is 90 years old called Ali Bashir once came to my office and I was lamenting and he told me, you know, your problem is you are always complaining about the windmill. The leaders. Do you know that the windmill moves in the direction that the wind dictates? So he told me, go and deal with the wind. Then you'll have no problem with the windmill. There is a problem with the African wind. And that is why the windmill will always move in the wrong direction. So Africa has twin problems, that of the windmill and that of the wind. Can I be elected? Am I electable in Kenya? No. I, can't, I speak too straight. I say it as it is. The electorate don't want somebody like me. They are not interested. So my ideas, will they ever go far? No. I'll die with them. Because I'll never have the opportunity to implement them. People like me, and there are many better people like me who have long receded. They are outside. The country does not allow it. In Sudan, where you come from, and I've been involved in your negotiations in Bahirdar, the problem is power. Garanti Madiar had power and ideas. Was he allowed to live for long? Sava has power. I don't think he has ideas. <laughs> you may disagree with me, the South Sudanese who are here. Riek Machar has ideas, but I think his quest for power drowns the ideas. And for that reason, the people of South Sudan will pay for it for the next 10 years, unfortunately. There will be no peace in South Sudan in the near future. I've been involved sufficiently to know. There may be calm in Juba, but what are we about in Bentiu? Too much blood has been spilled. There's now brother rising against brother. They'll fight until they are tired and the international community will ignore it. Now they are sanctioned since yesterday. The people with ideas have no power on the people. In Burkina Faso, there was a young man called Thomas Sankara with ideas. He came, said, changed the name of the country from Upper Volta to Burkina Faso. How long did he stay? Within a short time, the French organized for his assassination through Blaise Kampauri. He was told in advance that he would be killed by Blaise Kampauri, who was his friend, and this is what he said. If it is a Blaise who has said he's going to kill me, I have no defense. I will die. The man for whom I am named, Patrice Emery Lumumba, at age 36, and this is the letter he wrote, and I conclude with this, just before he was about to die, and read it in a season in the Congo, He's written to his wife called Josephine, but it's important to note that he had two wives called Josephine, so they both struggled for it, but I think it was meant for his first wife, Josephine Obango. And this is what he said. I now have no doubt that I'm going to die. But I die with my head high above with undestructible faith and profound belief in the destiny of my country than to live in humility and renounce the principles which I consider sacred to me because I know that the history of the Congolese will be written by the Congolese. He was then shot dead and his body drowned in acid. 
Congo has never been at rest since then. The people with ideas never survive in power. But yet we must never give up. Because it is a journey from generation to generation. Those who sow the seed will not enjoy the shade. One generation sows the seed, another one waters it, another one prunes it, and another one enjoys the shade. And that is our joy. There are no easy solutions, no instant coffee solutions. It is an intergenerational struggle. It will be well with us. God bless you.